smallish, just a few miles wooded path by the river where I walk again and again near where I live in Providence. And I walk there more out of anything because probably I'm a creature of habit. There's a ritualness to it. Uh, when I'm somewhere deeply familiar, my body experiences a level of familiarity, of knowing that doesn't feel the same when I walk in a new place. And so I return again and again. And I've adored watching week by week the emergence of spring, the green plants taller each week, of birds galore, and of the shifting sun on the water. But it's not to say that this urban paradise is simply bucolic. All winter, near one edge of this area, has set there has been a tent, and then two tents covered in a tarp a bicycle on the ground, a hibachi barbecue nearby. And it's clear to me that someone or someone's has been living there and has been throughout the pandemic. Through the deep cold of winter, through storms and weather of all sorts, this is all someone has of home. And I didn't know what to do. Do I approach? Do I offer food? Because I'm clear that whoever's there doesn't have other choices. And at first I hesitate really not knowing what to do. When I finally figure out that, you know, kind of the least I can do is to offer sustenance, is to bring food, it becomes clear that these are empty tents. Whoever occupies them must clear out during the day or is silent in order to not be bothered. So I respect that while also remaining very uncomfortable about doing nothing. So I walked there earlier this week and it's very clear that they're still there. And again, I did nothing, reminding myself that I was respecting their privacy. And I then walked a loop that I hadn't walked before. And to my surprise, I found another encampment, a much larger one, clearly multiple families, and clearly more established. And I stood still for a minute, just taking it in. And then I walked away feeling shame and frustration. Shame because I couldn't do more, because I hadn't done more. I could have left food, as I said. And then frustration because these paths, these paths are incredibly well used. Every time I'm on them, it's not just me. It's joggers and dog walkers and bicyclists. And we all just walk by. And I wonder what is the story we're telling ourselves that we simply allow this to be, that we recognize human suffering, but we're able to file it away in our mind and do nothing about it. And it makes me wonder about what my responsibility is to others. And that's the question I bring to you today and to myself. What is it we promise to each other, covenant to each other, spoken or unspoken? What happens when something shifts the way we see the world or each other? Does it shift the way we treat each other? And I've been thinking about this a lot lately, about the ways we work to guide the way that humans interact with each other. We pass laws mandating certain actions and prohibiting others. We write declarations, big ones like the Constitution, or small ones, or smaller ones like the Congregational Covenant, all intended to guide our actions, our considerations, and our approaches. And we agree, implicitly or explicitly, to live this way or to live that way, from big agreements like marriage vows to small agreements like those annoying boxes that you have to check that you've read the new Verizon contract every time you wanna make a change to your cell phone. Our heads and maybe to some extent our hearts are bound by these covenants. And there's some sense of, I will live this way because I have bound myself to live this way. 
And I say this with, you know, a somewhat heavy heart because there's a lot of laws right now that are aimed at taking away basic human rights that are trying to block individuals from participating in democracy, that want to stop the rights of women from deciding what's best for their bodies. And the list goes on, as you know. And we push back against that, of course we do. We protest when the decisions are particularly egregious. We find ways, large and small, to live outside of accepted norms. We come together as a community to think about the most marginalized, to rethink what we know, and to rethink what needs to change. And it, this is why in 2007, when I found Unitarian Universalism, I fell in love with it almost immediately. One of our precepts on the universalist side of our tradition, and I've talked about this, is that revelation is ongoing, that mystery and truth shift and change over time, and that the accumulation of new knowledge or understanding might change who and how we are. That what we know does not have some sense of permanency attached to it, but instead that we are free and invited to grow and change. So sometimes our perspectives shift, our heart is moved in a new way, and our response then too changes. But we have to wanna to see what's right in front of us. And it's something I've come to realize about that homeless encampment. I avoided it. I told myself the story I wanted to hear because it was easier to do that than to reach out to another human in need. And it's a mistake, I, I see that now. And that's what Unitarian Universalism asks of us. In all of that freedom to find our own spiritual journey is entwined this deep responsibility to keep asking the hard questions, the ones that make us uncomfortable, the ones that make us search our hearts for intentions, and the ones that help if we let it to guide us to a place of openness and clarity that we didn't have before. Before I was a Unitarian Universalist, I wasn't anti-racist, let alone an abolitionist. And I'm both now. Before UU community, I didn't understand why I should love my elders and how important they are. That I needed to see their history and their presence as deeply valuable. And I've learned that. And there's so much I've learned from this faith, who's worthy, and by the way, everyone, how to name uncomfortable truth, how to keep growing, and how to move back towards covenant when things grow astray. This is not meant to be a comfortable faith, comforting at times, but more. The beauty of this tradition is that it gives us space to ask, why are we doing that? Why are we ignoring? And what are we called to? This I can tell you. I've since gone back to those encampments with food. I can't call myself a Unitarian Universalist if I don't recognize and respond to the basic human dignity of those I encounter. And that's the invitation this week, to notice and perhaps respond in a new way what are the stories that you tell yourself? What are the ways if new truth arrives that you will be changed? This is the way we heal our own hearts and by extension, the world. So I invite us to remain open to revelation and to understand change as the gift of growth. Blessed be.